and welcome to the program where the leadership and membership of the Communist Party come together to discuss the pressing uh, issues of the week. Uh, Rosanna and uh, Anita, and uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm, we're not live yet. <laughs> it says uh -oh. we are. I get to practice. All right, it says we on. are. Oh, we are? Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, <this thing> fooled <laughs> me. Anyway, Rosanna and Good morning. Uh, Michael Good morning, and Revolution. Everybody, Anita, Scott, uh, in the woods again. Good morning, Revolution. Well, it's been quite a week. I always use that word quite, but it, it, it has been. But today, the jobs report came out, and uh, it, they expected, uh, Rosanna, a million jobs, but there were only a quarter million. And uh, our people are, are still suffering. And, uh, and the employers are trying to say hey. that there's a job uh, deficit demand and uh, that people aren't applying for jobs. And, uh, but the economists are saying that that's BS because wages aren't going up. So the employers are trying to trick us into uh, and and it, it might be aimed at some, Scott was just telling us that some Republican governors are opting out of the $300 supplement program. Outrageous, no, Rosanna? Very much so. I think it's, it's heartless and shameful that, you know, they claim to talk about family values and we're all for the people. And every single time they block what's best for the working people. And I think it's just, just shameless, just shameless. Scott, you, you were uh, saying that livid. you felt, huh? I'm livid about it. It's, it's um, you can see the, you know, what the Republican model for work in this country is. It's, it's, you know, people being forced back into jobs at poverty wages um, even, you know, an attempt to uh, provide people a little cushion, this, this $300 supplement to unemployment um, that, you know, gave the working class a little bit more power in, in terms of when to take a job, um, what they might be willing to work for, you know, that's being taken away to, to force people back into, you know, minimum wage uh, jobs. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's ridiculous. And you can really see you know, why you know, traditionally, um, you know, we've talked, our party and, and others have talked about wage slavery and um, the forced labor aspect of it is really coming out, I think, in this Republican plan. Well, it's kind of always, <clears throat> Anita, is wage slavery hyperbole? Is it like exaggerating? Uh, not at all. When you think about the, 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 the low minimum wage that we have in this country, because they did not raise it even a, you know, a few dollars. So, and a lot of those women, as we heard from that town hall the other day, a lot of those, um, those people who are unemployed are women who, who are at home with children that um, need childcare and don't have access to, to reliable and uh, affordable childcare. So I think a lot of those, um, you know, I mean, women in particular, as we have, have heard, have suffered a lot in this pandemic economy. And I think you see that exacerbated today. And to not have the $300, that's uh, ridiculous. Um, so. Well, I think that uh, the, the fact that, but they say the economy is booming, Michael. They say that, you know, the growth is going to be 7% this year. I mean, I mean, is it booming uh, uh, where you come from um, amongst your circle of people, family, are, are people, uh, is, is life picking up? Well, think there's a lot of talk about reopenings, but uh, again, in, in the people that I know, you know, in and around, whether they're, they're in New York, Ohio, wherever, um, a lot of them are still unemployed or they lost their job and they they got it back like if they work in the restaurant business or something um but their hours were cut you know to, to make it fair for for everyone because there's limited capacity still in a lot of these restaurants 
Um, and then of course I do know a couple of people who had like office jobs, you know, or nursing jobs or so forth. I have a cousin who's a nurse and she, um, only works four hours a, uh, a week right now, which you would think, wait a second, there's a pandemic going on and your hours were cut to four hours a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a sister who works for a bank and she is, uh, currently working from home and it's, uh, to be dated. Her office is open again but she's working uh, as a, in a home office until further notice. And so a lot of these uh, companies, whether they be you know, mostly private companies, uh, they close their offices during the pandemic and they cut a bunch of people off payroll you know, because they make more money that way, uh, but they don't plan on hiring these people back and they don't uh, plan on bringing a lot of these people back to the office because it's cheaper to keep them at home, you know, having their work life mixing with their personal life uh, and so forth. And so, um, some people, I guess, are feeling the shift, but as we talked about, the minimum wage hasn't been raised. Um, jo enough jobs haven't been created. And here in the in New York City, uh, the opening, I think it's, we're, we're opening up again on uh, May 19th, but, you know, I still know a lot of people who are unemployed. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if opening up uh, goes hand in hand with um, employment rates. I read yesterday in a, a column by Mr. Krugman that the real unemployment rate is not 6%, y'all, it's 10%, according to Krugman. And he said this is the figure that the folks in the Federal Reserve are uh, dealing with. So there's this magical thinking uh, trickery that's going on with respect to the uh, unemployment uh, numbers. Uh, and so the crisis is still very, very acute. And of course, for Black and Latino and Asians, the unemployment rate is double what it is for everybody else. And so, you know, the, the demand for uh, good paying jobs and for uh, unemployment compensation still is, is, is very, very much alive, you know. Uh, and, and, and that brings me to the issue of infrastructure week. Did y'all know that this week was Infrastructure Week uh, as uh, promulgated, uh, pronounced by the White House? Mm. Uh, Anita, did you know that? I, I didn't know that, but uh, we've been waiting for it for a really long time, uh, promised uh, uh, in numerous uh, years. But, um, but I think, I mean, the proposal that Biden is putting forward, he calls the jobs bill rather than the infrastructure bill. And I think, uh, you know, that will uh, at least address Begin to address some of the some of the issues if if those um, measures are able to be implemented. Uh, uh, Rosanna, they say that this is uh, at once a, a jobs bill, but it's also uh, a green environmental bill uh, that they will uh, put forward far-reaching proposals to completely revamp the economy on a green basis, you know? So I wanna know, when are you guys, you and Arturo planning to go out and buy your fully powered electric uh, vehicle, your new electric car? I mean, <laughs> are you guys saving up for that? No, we're not. <laughs> Unfortunately, the last car we bought, we had intended to buy uh, an, an uh, ed energy efficient, those uh, hybrids, but they were out of our price range. Mm. They were totally out of our price range. So that's part of the problem. I think the other thing is, you know, Biden can say a lot of things that, you know, he can put forth a plan, but I think many of us have to keep in mind that it's not a set, it's not a done deal. There's still a whole lot of hurdles that have to be uh, passed. And I think uh, more and more, it seems that we do need to, to increase the, the Dems in the Senate. Otherwise, none of this is going to happen. So for our interest, we, we have to look to 2022 and get rid of some of those Republicans that I have already said they were going to obstruct anything that he says. It's not good for the working class. Well, that's, a, that's a really... Go ahead, Scott. That's a really um, important kind of uh, methodological point as well, I guess, uh, because, you know, we see oftentimes when people talk, like try to analyze the, the Biden administration or, or, you know, the behavior of administrations in general, um, the question becomes, uh, what is 
what is Biden really? What is this administration really? Is it really friendly to the workers? Is it really um, neoliberal? Is it et cetera? What is its actual character? And it, I think that's the wrong question to ask. It's a, that, that, that paints the administration as a very static thing that's, um, you know, sort of has this consistent essence, right? That's controlling, and, and that's not what it is. Uh, the dialectical way of looking at it is to say, you know, what are the forces that are shaping um, these positions of the administration, right? The, clearly the infrastructure plan um, would not have been possible without the push from the labor movement, from the environmental movement, um, uh, but there is counter pressure as well. So rather than asking, uh, what does this say about Biden and who he is or the administration and what it is, the question is, as Rosanna posed it, what do we have to do to shift forces enough to, to get this thing through? Well, it's all and, about the class and democratic struggle, right? Were you about to say something, Anita? I was. I was thinking on uh, a good example of what Scott is saying is uh, what Biden said about refugees, that he would only accept he would continue with the Trump number of 15,000 a year. And that, that caused outrage among people uh, who, who care about the ability of, of refugees to come to this country. And so he's uh, up the number to 62,000 as he had promised or was closer to what he promised during the campaign. So I think that was a good example of people pressuring him and, you know, or pressuring that administration and having some results come out of that. Push, 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 Michael including on issues of foreign policy, you know, because it, it seems to me that that's probably the weakest link in, link in the uh, chain with respect to uh, the policy agenda that the, uh, that the people who inhabit the White House and who hold the majority in the uh, House and the Senate, um, that, 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 that kind of political pressure particularly on issues of foreign policy are key, don't you think? Yeah, and they do go hand in hand with immigration. You have to think about uh, the imperialist policies, particularly in Central America, um, and even in, in Mexico, if you think of how NAFTA negatively affects the economy in Mexico, that's the reason why a lot of them, you know, come here for a better life or to flee violence in the case of, you know, Honduras, El Salvador, and so on. And so, you know, they are linked to, you know, immigration is often seen as a domestic policy, but you know it's coming from the outside. It's also seen as foreign policy, and of course, you know the anti-China rhetoric uh, that continues uh, domestically as a result of Trump's, you know, racist, you know, calling it the Chinese virus and and so on. That's continuing in, in Biden's foreign policy. You know, the uh, blaming China for everything that's going on in the world. Um, you know, it, it's not doing much for those uh, QAnon conspiracy theories that we're trying to defeat, you know, talking about how the virus was intentionally created in a Chinese lab and so forth. And so that has to stop. In addition to, you know, the, the hawkishness towards, you know, Syria, as we saw, uh, you know, the, the strike against Syria, and of course, uh, the ongoing sanctions on countries like Venezuela and Cuba, those have to uh, come to an end. You can't have a progressive working class policy here at home, such as the infrastructure plan and continue these aggressive policies. Now, the political balance is shifting now. We have to keep that in mind too, Scott. And that's part of your fancy dialectical word, <laughs> uh, understanding of the way things are, are moving forward. And one example of that is Liz Cheney. She's in the news this week. She's about to get kicked out of the uh, House uh, second or third Republican position and a congresswoman from New York is about to take her place because she opposed Trump. So Scott, I have a question for you. Are you in coalition now with Liz Cheney as part of the broad people's front? Um, I think Hello? You know, the, the, way, the way it was uh, posed to me once um, by a comrade that I like was, you know, I'm not, I'm not deciding right now, you know, who I'm in coalition with. I'm with the working class fighting for the interests of the working class. And um, Liz Cheney can decide if she is part of the movement against the extreme right, against reaction. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to waste my time thinking about whether she's my ally or not, because I wouldn't rely on her for anything. <laughs> Good Boy, you stepping around. <laughs> well, if you were a dancer, you'd be Fred Astaire. One, Anita, one, one more thing before Liz I before Cheney, I stop wait here. Wait a minute now. I'm going to Anita. Liz Cheney. Uh, 
She was the one I read this morning who circulated that circular letter of the, the 10 defense secretaries uh, warning mm -hmm. about the politicization. Did I say that word correctly? I don't want to sound like Archie yes. Bunker. Uh, <laughs> bringing the, making the military political. Uh, and are you in coalition with uh, Liz Cheney? Uh, well, I, I I think in her party she's a a braver person than every than you know ninety nine point nine percent of them because they know that what Trump is saying was a big lie. Uh, apparently, he's uh, every every wedding that takes place at Mar-a-Lago he drops in and and complains about having how the election was stolen from him. So, um, but that big lie, I I think I think it's going to take, frankly, uh, one more election cycle. Uh, they. Um, that uh, strategy from the GOP has lost them the White House, the Senate, and the, and the House of Representatives. And I think if we get really um, Trumpy candidates that win their primaries, I think hopefully more progressive forces will be able to win the, the, the general elections. So we'll see if it bites them in the end. Rosanna, Liz Cheney voted with Trump 93% of the time. And yet, she has broken with Trump now and said that she is that Trump is uh, a dangerous, uh, uh, crazy uh, threat to uh, democracy. Uh, are we in coalition with Liz Cheney? I don't think so. <laughs> At least I'm not. You know, I mean, she's <clears throat> she'll sell her grandmother if it's going to get her where she wants to go. And that's pretty much a lot of these extreme rightist people that they, and capitalists, they, they, you know, they're willing to do whatever to reach their own personal goals. So we'll see what she's up to and, and we'll see what the Republican Party as a whole are up to in attacking her. They may be pushing all of the anti-Trump people out of, out of that, you know, all the, maybe those who are resisting fascist tendency, the fascism out of the Republican Party to fully, you know, make the Republican Party a fascist party. I'm not sure. Michael, when it was cold outside, I used to say, it's cold out here as Dick Cheney's heart. And his daughter, Liz Cheney, uh, is, you know, pretty much in uh, uh, full step with her dad. But on the uh, threat of fascism and the role that Trump played, particularly what happened on January 6th, she's broken with them. So are you and the you in coalition with Liz Cheney? I think that's a question for Liz Cheney. We should ask her if she's in coalition with the Communist Party. <laughs> no, no, on a serious <laughs> note, I would say, you know, I, I look back to World War II and I ask myself, you know, you see these pictures of like Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill all sitting together. And I'm sure they didn't agree on like anything other than defeating Hitler and Mussolini, you know? And, and so sure, you know, you, you know, allies, quote unquote friends, you know, against the, the fascist danger, whatever that's, you know, we want a large anti-fascist people's front. That's great. But in terms of uh, coalition, uh, formal coalition, I don't think so, you know, but short term uh, goals such as defeating the fascist danger, that's something we have to get everyone on board with, yeah. Scott, no friend, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. Is that your position with respect to uh, Liz um, Cheney? Uh, firmness in principle and flexibility in tactics and, um, you know, there is no member or section of the ruling class that is a, a reliable um, permanent ally of the working class in, in the fight for socialism. Um, if, if she can contribute something to the great democratic struggle, you know, I welcome that, I love that, but I don't look to her. Um, well, we do have permanent friends. The working class is our permanent ally. That, that, that goes uh, up to, through uh, the achievement of social, socialism, a social revolution, and I'm Absolutely. through the uh, abolition of the state because we are in favor eventually of the abolition of the state. Well, enough about uh, Liz Cheney. Uh, I think our program is coming to a, a close. 
today. Do we have any uh, uh, programs coming up that we need to announce anybody? That we have a school, a summer school, uh, Rosanna. Uh, what, are, what are the dates? Uh, July 23rd through August the 1st. You're coming to New York City, right? Yes, I am. I'm really excited. I went to a school that really changed my life back in when I was in my 20s. So uh, I know this school is going to be a, a, a great contribution to, to our movement. And I'm excited. I'm very excited to come out and meet everyone and, you know, uh, I don't know, contribute in whatever way I can. Anita, 116 people have applied oh, to Lord. the school so far. I don't know wow. what we're going to do. Uh, I hope I don't know I, if I have the whole time. I know a lot of them are from Ohio because I, I there's a lot of interest in this in this school in in the district I'm in. So, yep. Oh my goodness, Scott, we're going to have to uh, hold classes on three floors. You know, pretty. Forty. It's, just, it's going to be. It's going to be wonderful, the chance to see people, see comrades in person again and, you know, really enjoy just that, you know, collective life of the party. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've got so many people that somebody in the uh, national board meeting the other night suggested we need to stop saying the school is going to be fun. It's going to be <laughs> grim and toilsome <laughs> and difficult. Um, so, uh, no, but it's, it's going to be great. And I'm, I'm hoping to uh, attend as well, though I haven't put my application in yet. Um, so, uh, yeah. Well, oh, you don't need to apply, comrade. We're going to draft your behind to teach. You're going <laughs> to be teaching big time if, if your family will let you come to New York. But perhaps your uh, 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 wife and the daughter I'll, I'll will come too along. Because, because they can teach as well. Michael, uh, everybody who comes has to have a COVID vaccine card certification uh, indicating that you ain't gonna make nobody sick, right? I mean, that's one of the qualifications. Absolutely, and we'll sign them up for therapy after taking a class with me. So that'll be complimentary. <laughs> and, 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 and do you need to be a member of the Communist Party to come? My no, friend. no. All you need is, a, you know, sincere interest and, in, you know, joining in the struggle and interest in the YCL or the party. Um, but other than that, you can sign up. So it's open. I think it's also important to note that there is going to be a code of conduct. And, you know, because if we're if we're serious about a movement, we have to be serious about our behavior, which includes drinking and drugs and all of those kinds of things. So I think that's also something that everyone should know. Yeah, and, sexual and, harassment policy too will be in course, effect. Of course, yeah, all of that, all of that is included. So, uh, you know, this, this is a serious thing, and and it's an important uh, school. Uh, so we we are going to take it seriously, but we're also going to have a lot of fun. The Little Red Schoolhouse, y'all, presents Marxism for the year twenty twenty one and beyond, and uh, so we're going to be. Anita, uh, and we, we're looking for you to come, Anita. I'd and, love to uh, come help. to New York in the summertime, so, you know. Good. <laughs> draft <because> me. <laughs> we're going to have to have three sections, you know, one mm -hmm. on the seventh floor, one on the uh, third floor, one on the second. We might even have to have one on the roof, you know, if, <laughs> the numbers, if the numbers keep going up. We'll be singing that old song, Up on the Roof. <laughs> That's showing how old I am. With that, uh, everybody have a good week. Go to cpusa.org. Uh, you can sign up for the school on our webpage, on our Facebook page, and uh, we'll see you next week. Until then, uh, stay strong, stay safe, and stay in the struggle. Take care, everybody. Have Thank a good you, everybody. Week. Bye. Thank you. Good morning, comrades. Sir.